bit test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a man talking to a receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to seven. Good evening, sir. Do you have a reservation? Yes. Let me just check I've got everything. Um, sorry. Yes, a reservation. It's in the name of Hartley, Martin Hartley. Let me see. Oh, yes. Here it is. That's for three nights. Yes, that's right. Do you need my passport? I just need to take the number as a form of ID. No problem. Now, can I just ask you to fill in this registration form, please? Ah, actually, no. You see, I've broken my wrist. Yes, I noticed that. I'm afraid form filling is something I can't manage right now. Not without a lot of pain, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I'm sorry, sir, but don't worry. I can complete the form for you. That's very kind of you. What do you need to know? Well, let's start with your name, of course. So that's Martin. Um. Hartley. That's H A R T L E Y. Thanks. And your address? Forty-five. Carlisle Way. Could you spell Carlisle for me? Sorry. It's C A R L I S L E. You don't pronounce the S. <sighs> Carlisle Way, and that's in Lewis. L E W E S. And is there a state? I don't think you have states in the UK. No, we have counties. It's East Sussex. Sussex is with double S. The postcode is L W four six A U. Do you want my phone number? Actually, no. We contact people by email now. Ah, yes. And send me lots of advertising too, I suppose. <laughs> My email is Hartley Nitram at Yahoo dot co dot uk. Sorry, a bit slower, please. Hartley, my surname, then Martin backwards N I T R A M. That's all one word. And all lowercase. That's right, no capitals. At yahoo.co.uk. Thank you very much, Mr. Hartley. And could you give me your passport now, please? Thanks. You can have that back now. Ah. Oh. And that's for three nights. So checking out on Sunday morning. Uh huh. Okay. You're in room sixteen. That's on the first floor, overlooking the courtyard. Here's your key. Would you like somebody to take your bag? Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. Do you have a map I can take? Yes, of course. We've usually got lots of them here, somewhere. Ah, yes. 
Here we are. Thanks. Could you show me where we are exactly? Um, let me have a look. Um, ah, yes. This is our street here, Avenida Constitución. The bigger hotels are marked, so let me just see which one is us. Um, here, yes, here. This is Hotel Columbus, just before you get to the museum. I say just before because that's the way most people get here. I mean, coming from the main square where all the buses stop, or from the station. Yes, that's the way the taxi came in from the airport. I thought we drove past the museum, though, just after we went through that big square you mentioned. Ah, you probably mean here. That's actually an art gallery. It's worth having a look round, but the museum's more interesting. I think so, anyway. Thanks for the tip. I hope I get time. Right, well, tomorrow I've got to be at the conference centre. They told me they'd put me in a hotel that wasn't too far away. Oh, yes. The conference centre's not too far at all. Let me see. Uh, yes, down here. You can walk there in seven or eight minutes. Just cross over the road and go straight down this street here. That will take you towards the newer part of the city. Walk on for a couple of blocks, and then when you get here, you just have to go right a very short distance, and then you'll see the conference centre above the other buildings. It's quite big. I see. That all looks quite straightforward. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Have a nice evening, sir. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking about a parliament building. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everyone. Can you all see and hear me? Good. Now, my name's Dan, and I'm your guide this morning for our tour of the New Zealand Parliament. Now, we're standing in the executive wing of the Parliament complex. This is where all the government ministers have their offices and where the Prime Minister and the Cabinet meet. Now, most people here refer to this building as the Beehive and no prizes for guessing why it's called the Beehive. That's right. It's shaped exactly like a traditional Beehive and it's one of the most famous buildings in Wellington. Now, I'll start with some background information about the design and construction of the building. It may come as a surprise for you to learn that the architect wasn't a New Zealander. No. In fact, it was designed by a Scottish architect, Sir Basil Spence. He designed the concept for the building during a visit he made to our city in 1964. His idea was that all the offices and rooms would radiate from a central core. Now, the Beehive was built in stages over ten years. Construction began on building the underground car park and the basement at the end of the 1960s, in 1969. And over the next decade, the remaining floors were constructed. Yes, one decade later, in 1979, the first parliamentary offices moved in. 
Now, as you can see, the beehive is pretty high. In fact, it's seventy-two meters tall. It has ten floors above ground, and an additional four floors below. So that's a total of fourteen floors altogether. That means there's plenty of space for the many facilities available to the members of Parliament and ministers to use. These include a small theatre and a television studio. Now, if you'd all just like to follow me, we can make our way inside the building itself. Now you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Here we are in the entrance foyer. It's a very airy space, isn't it? And if you look at the floor you're standing on, you'll see it's made of marble. And if you look to your left, you can see some beautiful columns. They are also made from marble. Now look at the wall panels. They are made of stainless steel. They look really stunning, don't they? Now, straight ahead of us is the staircase leading to the first floor of the building. As you can see, the railings on the staircase are made of bronze. Now, let's make our way up this beautiful staircase to the banquet hall on the first floor, and we can admire these beautiful bronze railings on the way. So, this is the banquet hall. And as you can see, it's shaped in the form of a semicircle. It's also a pretty big space, isn't it? It's actually a big enough dining room to hold up to three hundred guests. Now look at the large mural to your right. It's three-dimensional and shows the atmosphere and sky of New Zealand. And the floor we're standing on is made of wood. It's a native New Zealand timber called tawa. Okay, now let's make our way to the. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. That essay we have to write—the one on how children learn through the media. How are you planning to write it? Well, I've given it some thought, and I think that the best way to approach it is to divide the essay into two parts. First of all, we'd have to look at some examples of each type of media. Yes, what they are. Then we could describe how we can use each medium so that children can learn something from each one. Exactly. Maybe we could draw up a table and look at examples of each medium in turn.、Mm. Uh, let's see.、Um, the different forms of media would be the print media. Here you'd have things like books and newspapers. That's Sort of thing,、mm. and included in these are the pictorial forms of print media, like maps. Yes, maps are really just formal pictures, aren't they?、Mm. And then there are what we call the audio forms of media. 
where children can listen, mm-hmm. CDs and radios are probably the best examples because a lot of children have access to these, especially radios. And this would lead into the audiovisual media, mm. which can be seen as well as heard. Uh, film, television, uh, and we mustn't forget videos. Yes, but there's a final category as well. Computers mm-hmm. that make up the so-called electronic media. In the United Kingdom and Australia, they say that one in three families has a computer now. Yes, I believe it. Well, uh, that's a good list to start with. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We're really getting somewhere with this essay now. Hmm. So let's move on to when each type of medium could be used. I guess we could start by trying to identify the best situation for each type of media. What do you mean? I'm talking about whether each medium should be used with different size groups. For example, we could look at pictures and ask whether they're more useful for an individual child, a few children together, or a full class. In this case, I'd say pictures are best with individual children because they give them an opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. Yes, I see. Let's take tapes next. Although tapes look ideal for individual children, I feel they're best suited to small group work. Mm. This way, children don't feel isolated, because they can get help from their friends. Computers are the same. I think they're better with small numbers of children, and they're hardly ever useful with a whole class. Videos, however, are ideal for use with everyone present in the class, especially when children have individual activity sheets to help them focus their minds on what's in the video. And what about books? What would you recommend for them? Books are ideal for children to use by themselves. Mm. I know they're used with groups in schools, but I wouldn't recommend it. Other pictorial media like maps, though, are different. I'd always plan group work around those. Mm. Give the children a chance to interact and to share ideas. Mm, I agree. Teachers often just leave maps on the wall for children to look at when they have some free time. But kids really enjoy using them for problem solving. Yes. Different people have different ideas, I suppose. Yeah, and different teachers recommend different tools for different age groups. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to introduce you all to Donald McKenzie, who has recently returned from a 12-month research project in America. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to see so many of you here today. As I told you all on Monday, the lecture on overpopulation has been postponed until next week, as we have a guest speaker today. 
I'd like to introduce you all to Donald McKenzie, who has recently returned from a 12-month research project in America. He is here to share with us some of the results of his studies into the problem of illiteracy. Hello. Now, as sociology students, I have no doubt that you are aware that it is commonly believed that one indicator of a developed country is the level of education of its citizens. Now, most of these nations have free compulsory education for all and strict teacher certification requirements. So it would logically follow that people from countries such as America would be highly educated. Yet, this isn't always so. In America alone, 42 million adults cannot read, and 50 million can recognize so few printed words, they each have the reading ability of a 10-year-old. Frightening statistics, indeed. But not as frightening as the trend suggested by current estimates. The number of illiterate adults is increasing by approximately two and a quarter million people each year. And although global statistics have not been compiled, it suggests an extremely disturbing figure. Now, inevitably, this is having an impact on employment. In America, the annual cost in welfare programs and unemployment compensation due to illiteracy stands at six billion U.S. dollars, and an additional two hundred and thirty-seven billion a year in unrealized earnings is forfeited by people who lack basic reading skills. There is also the cost of post-school literacy programs, which have been put in place in order to counter this increasing figure. A conservative estimate places the cost of these programs at $10 billion each year and growing steadily. Moving on. I'd like to talk about some of the causes of this increasing illiteracy. Children who are taught to read by first learning the alphabet, then the sounds of each letter, how they blended into syllables, and how those syllables made up words. They were taught that English spelling is logical and systematic, and that to become a fluent reader it was necessary to master the alphabetic code in which English words are written, to the point where the code is used automatically with little conscious thought given to it. And to make myself clear, I mean readers could sound out the letters, spelling them phonetically. Once a child learned this ability, attention could be turned to more advanced content. It seldom, if ever, occurred to teachers to give children word lists to read, or to make beginner-level readers memorize whole words before learning the components of those words, or to memorize whole stories, as today's proponents of the whole language approach recommend. Several recent studies have found that 90% of remedial reading students in developed countries are not able to decode fluently, accurately, and at an automatic level of response. The currently used whole language method was originally conceived and used in the early 1800s to teach the deaf how to read, a method which has long since been discarded by the teachers of the deaf themselves as inadequate and outmoded. English is an alphabetic language that, that when written, uses letters to represent speech sounds. When students were taught to read, they consciously identified the speech sounds and learned to recognize the letters used to represent them. They were then trained to apply this information to decode the names of unwritten words, understand their meaning, and comprehend the information presented as a complete thought. The English language contains approximately half a million words. Now, of these words, about 300 compose about three-quarters of the words that we use regularly. 
As I said, in schools where the whole language method is taught, children are constantly memorizing sight words during the first three or four grades of school, but are never taught how to unlock the meaning of the other 499,700 or more words. Whole language learning causes frustration, poor spelling, and hostility towards reading. Very bright children who can't memorize long lists of words and retain their meaning are placed in special education, when all they need is to be taught the 26 letters of the alphabet, the 44 sounds they make, and the 70 common ways to spell those sounds. Some researchers believe dyslexia and the symptoms of attention deficit disorder are actually caused by this reversal of the normal learning sequence. So, why do faulty reading methods continue to be used? Well, in short, it's big business. The sale of instructional reading programs is big business today. Each year, publishing companies compete for the adoption of reading programs and workbooks, which have to be replaced annually. Concentrating on phonics would seriously reduce the cost of education. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.